I think Trent's just still got a minute record. No question. Um, Trent, I guess you're recording for your stuff, your live stream? Yeah. Okay, cool. No, not live stream. I'm, I'm just recording these for TV. Okay, cool. We're good. Wayne, can I say something? Please. Yeah, I'm just going to say, y'all are in for a treat. If y'all are kind of more like people and you spend any time on the internet and you've seen enough um, bacon comments or whatever, uh, that's not Trent. Trent's going to bring much better arguments, and we're going to have these foundational differences that are completely opposed. But at the same time, Trent's going to make points that really challenge your position, and that's what you, we all want, right? Like, we want to have our position challenged so we can know you know our argument needs to be improved or whatever, so yeah. this is a treat in my opinion. Really yeah. Thank really good, earnest conversation with somebody who's going to offer some valid points. Yeah, you can turn a little Thank towards you. me, Trent, because it's as much a conversation it's as you could. But, yeah, if you put that kind of pressure on me on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> no, people have seen your live streams. I shared them quite a bit. People in the Amazon movement know about you because it is pretty unique. You and Rick Pittman are the only two farmers who I think have been really that willing to have good faith conversations. And I, like I said, I do appreciate that. Um, I was thinking we might set some ground rules. I mean, the topic for today, I apologize, Trent, I don't even think we made this clear to you. But the question we thought we could discuss today is just quite simply is slaughtering animals for food justified? And, and we have very different perspectives on this, and I agree with Paul percent We don't want to hear the weakest arguments against our position, we want to hear the strongest. Because when we go out there in the world and actually trying to do outreach, it's not going to help us to, to be good outreachers and activists with respect to the weakest positions. We need to know what are the things that are going to spark us to overcome. And I think Trent does have, frankly, just a lot of factual information, having been somebody who's been in the industry. But I thought before we even start this conversation, you should feel free to jump in anytime. Oops. Um, we might set some ground rules for everyone, including those in the audience. Trying not to break my equipment. I will try my best because that seems nice. Yeah, yeah. I'll put it in my pocket. It is nice. Yeah. Yeah, yeah sure. Yeah. Your stuff is high quality. Um, I it, thought also, we, it also has parts of animals that make it work. Really? It's just steric acid. Not steric acid. Steric acid, which holds the components together. This yeah. Is no, I mean, that's true. I, did I tell you that there is. Oh, I just pushed the button. I'm going to turn it off. I didn't turn it off for that. I mean, you got a blue light on? Uh, so good? Yeah, you're good. Okay. Um, so anyways, I, steric acid is in uh, a lot of rubber, and it can be made from tire. We have some tires, and Thanks you can shoes, them. things like that, you don't even know, and it's, it's often taken from bull testicles. My understanding is they've shifted a lot to non-animal-based production, but there's still a lot of it coming from bull testicles. We couldn't live stream on your, on your little phone right there if it wasn't for steric acid for animals. Yeah. Well, and I think, I mean, this is one of the things we discussed before. I, this might be an area where we agree. That I think that at least vegans who make perfection the enemy of the good and condemn other individuals merely for not being righteous enough are just doing wrong. Because we're all part of the system. You're part of the system. I'm part of the system. I pay my taxes to the U.S. government. A huge amount of that goes to farmers for food production, rightly or wrongly. Oh, yeah. So I, do you want to discuss that? Because that's a misnomer right off the bat. Well, well tell me. What are your, what are your thoughts? Are your thoughts? Actually, let me back up and just put some ground rules. I want to make some ground rules, especially for the audience and people on social media. Probably the most important one, and this is, you know, as much for us as, as for Trent, because I know Trent's a respectful guy, and he, he jokes around with me, but he's always been very polite. I think no personal insults. Is that okay, everybody? Yeah. And that means for you, too. That means for you on social media. No personal insults. We're grateful to you for being here today. Uh, I'm sure you're not going to insult me, but we don't want to see any insults. Second problem I want to suggest. My mom might be watching. The last thing I'm going to do is insult somebody. <laughs> That's good. All right. Yeah, I mean, yeah, gotta live up to our mom's hands. But the second problem I was going to suggest is, at the end of this conversation, we're going to have some disagreements. I would like us to try and summarize and find some points of consensus. Does that sound good to you? That sounds great. Okay, good. But tell us about farm systems. What well, do you think of farm okay. systems? Before I do that, why don't I do this? Just so everybody knows, I'm 55 years old. My family came from Germany to Quincy, Illinois in 1832, and we've been taking care of land and livestock every day since 1832. And personally, in my own life, I have cared, provided daily care for more than one million animals in my life. And I think that that gives me some credibility in terms of talking about, like the video you showed before, because I've had animals in every environment you can bring up. And, and so that I just wanted as a baseline. And these are one in a million animals that kill for food. One million animals that have been harvested for food, correct. And today we have pigs, we have cattle, we have horses, and at one point in time we've had 300 mother goats. 
So we've had a whole gamut, and we've had a few sheep along the way. So I have, I have had a whole gamut, and I have firsthand experience on taking care of animals. And our number one job as a steward of the animal is to minimize stress. If I, as an animal owner, am not doing every single thing possible to keep that animal living a stress-free life, it's not going to work for me, it's not going to work for the animal, and I'm soon going to be gone. As a 55-year-old who's been farming on my own since 1985, I've never once taken a dollar from the federal government. There are not subsidies that go into the production of milk, meat, and eggs. If you want to extrapolate that out, the only subsidy today that goes to the farmer is ultimately through the, well, there's two, two ways. One is the subsidization of crop insurance, mm -hmm. where farmers are buying crop insurance. It's extremely high. You couldn't afford it. The, the sentiment is not believe in any subsidy. I want subsidies gone everywhere. Across the board. Including for crop insurance. Including crop insurance. Because you call that not a, crop, not a real subsidy, but Smithfield Foods, for example, benefits to the tune of almost a billion dollars every year just from crop insurance subsidies. Because their feed prices are much lower because of crop insurance. I want crop insurance subsidies gone. I want airline industry subsidies gone. I want, you, man. I want WIC subsidies gone. I want everybody to get back to that supply and demand. Okay? So from a subsidy standpoint, we really don't reap the harvest. At one point in time, there was some subsidies that went to crop producers for pick and, and different things. We've weaned away from all of those. 82% of the U.S. farm budget each year goes to women, uh, women, infant, and children. Goes to mothers in that form of the subsidy. Only 20%, roughly, of the total U.S. farm budget from the USDA goes into farm subsidies to farmers. That's changing. With Biden. Biden is trying to change it. For example, in the most recent Inflation Reduction Act, $369 million in that Inflation Reduction Act is going into conservation programs to retire land from food production. We call it 30 by 30. It's a goal, a global goal, to remove 30% of the land from food production in the world by 2030. Wayne, that means for you and I both, whether we believe in animal consumption or not, starvation for many of the eight billion people on the planet. Yeah, I, I will not I will not defend the Biden administration because there are many issues, including the recent Prop 12 debate where the Biden administration has not been kind to animals. I will push back on farm subsidies. You say only twenty percent of the farm bill correct. goes to farm subsidies. That's correct. But this is one of the largest bills in the United States history. Mm -hmm. It is something that sends hundreds of billions of dollars to feed the 300 million people in this country. And 20% might seem small to you, but if I told you one out of five dollars that's spent on food is spent on subsidizing some of the largest factory farms in the nation, including Smithfield Foods. And crop insurance, you make it seem like not a big deal. But again, that's going to suggest that Smithfield Foods, one of the richest and most powerful corporations in the world, mm -hmm. that's owned largely and controlled by a billionaire in China, Estimates suggest they get a billion dollars a year in our taxpayer dollars. A billion dollars. And that's not a small amount of money. Man. And we're back to where we started. We're in agreement on this one. So we're right, let's do it. I'm so let's shut it down. I'm not in favor of any subsidy to anybody. Yeah. So this is one area of agreement. I'm glad to point out that Smithfield is owned by WH Group out of Hong Kong. And they do produce 33% of the pigs in the United States. I never have been. Smithfield should have never caved. In 2007, the, the rhetoric they gave the gestation stalls, they've not been a good actor, just from an ownership standpoint. So let's push back on that a little bit. What do you mean by the rhetoric around gestation crate stalls? For those of you who don't know, gestation stalls are two foot by seven foot metal crates, right. about 14 square feet of space, and other pigs will live you know, from six to 16 weeks before they go to a farrowing crate, which is similarly small, mm -hmm. and they'll cycle back and forth between the two. This is a 600, 700 pound animal, usually. 350 to 600. Yeah, I mean, if it's a Yorkshire pig in a commercial facility, it's going to feel it's probably going to be on a higher end. Um, in, the natural, in, in the natural environment, I, you know, the San Diego Zoo has done an estimate of how big of a range wild pigs have, and they suggest that wild pigs usually range at least 60 acres. Why do they do that? Because they're exploring for food. They're curious, exactly they're interested. Right. They're exactly right. They're looking for food. They range in a 60 mile area because they're ranging for food. I can leave the doors open in my house, which, by the way, my wife constantly complaining that I have pigs running loose. But what do they do every night? They run back to the same shed they were in during the day because that's where they seek comfort. Those pigs that are seeking your number 60 acres 
They're number one looking for food because they can't rely on a human, they have to find it on themselves. And the other thing they arranged that day in the airport is the number one challenge that all animals have, predators. So and if you think it's just about food, it's 100% about survival. Why do you need to close the cage door? Why not just leave it open? If you really think these pigs are happy sitting in these cages? Because predators will go in and eat these animals. 600 pound model pig? Absolutely. What predator is going to get a 600 pound model pig? I've had not mine stay down horses. Horses weigh a thousand plus. Yeah, but all these animals have predators. Yeah, I would push back on that. I mean, I, I've been at sanctuaries that have 600 pound model pigs that live for years in the outdoors. Johnny raised his hand because he's got some big pigs out of Sage Mountain. They don't worry about mountain lions and coyotes because these pigs can no, take them down. Say that again. You got them protected. No. You got to protect them from the yeah. elements, yeah. give them shelter yeah. from, from the rain, the, the winter. The don't approach the pigs. Yeah. They're scared. A mountain lion, the biggest mountain lion is going to be what, 250 pounds, something like that maybe? 300 yeah. pounds? They're not going to be able to take down a lot of pigs. It's going to be hard. They're not this coming is down. not an argument you're going to win because mountain lions and coyotes take down food animals every single day. They do occasionally. I would say mother pigs are one exception. I don't think a crate can be justified on the basis of There is of one crate. justification for a Please. gestation crate. It's two by seven. And I've had sows in gestation crate. Currently, we do not. I wish we did. We made a change a few years ago. It was a mistake. The one you did the right pet, thing. The, the one pet peeve of mine is bubble biting. And when you have a boss sow, you talk about being bullied as a kid. Sows in every environment have a boss sow and they have the weak ones. And the weak ones go cower and lay in the corner all the time because those sows are the most ruthless thing ever. And I, in my house, just in the last month, we made some changes. We tried to reduce our sow herd number. We have about 60 sows. We don't have a big operation. We got rid of those big, fat, heavy sows that were the boss sows, giving all that grief to the other sows. You know what happened? New boss sow service. The way you protect, the reason that we have gestation stalls is you, that's the best way to protect the pig. And to the point, and you probably know they're out there, you're not sharing the story, there are many pork producers that have actually given this a try. And they'll have wide open what people would consult, call free range, and then they would have free access to stalls. And where do those sows spend most of their time? In the stalls, because they have a sense of comfort. Yeah, I mean, this is actually an argument that I buy a more than a predator argument because I think there is some evidence, and I think the Animal Rights Act is we should look the world the way it is, even if we don't like it. And I think there is some evidence that group housing is in many ways worse. Um, so, for example, Prop 12, which I'm supportive of, this is a ballot initiative in California, 65 or so percent of Californians voted to support it, it abolishes gestation crates and moves pigs to group housing where they live not just alone in a little isolated cage, but in groups where they get about 24 square feet of space. And there is some good data suggesting aggression uh, and injury is much higher in these group housing environments. The reason I think this is not... Say reverse from another place of common ground. Go we ahead. do have some common ground. But the reason I think this isn't an argument for factory farming and for gestation crates is 24 square feet just isn't enough. Right? 24 square feet What's in group housing is at 5 foot by 5 foot square. No. It's better than a gestation crate that's 15 square feet of space. But when pigs in the wild trend, they want 2.4 million square feet. That is the minimum estimate. The San Diego Zoo estimated that pigs in the natural environment want 2.4 million square feet of space to range. And you're giving them 15 or 24? Either of those numbers is bad. And so in the wild, if you've got a pig that's fighting another pig, the pig that's getting beaten up just walks off. So how many that's what I did when I was a kid. That's why I'm still alive today, because space, I get walk off of these How much space would those feral hogs cover if somebody went out there every day and poured feed source in the middle of them? So it's going to be less. I don't disagree yeah, with that. Like in a sanctuary, for example. Yeah. Our it's going to be much less. I'm not arguing every pig in the wild, if you gave them a feed source, would range over that entire 60 months square, or not just 60 square months, 60 acres. But they're certainly not going to stay in 24 square feet of space. And they're certainly not going to stay in a crate so small they cannot stand up and turn around. And we come back to my original statement. As a steward of the animals and the land, my job is to minimize the stress. Whatever the stress may be, Mother Nature is the number one stressor. Way, uh, rain, hail, wind, snow, you name it, mud, heat, all of these things. Well, look, look what's happened in California in the last two weeks. That's our number one stressor. But my job as an animal steward is to determine how do I keep this animal at the highest level of optimum health, and that's through minimizing stress. Because I don't use antibiotics. I don't want to use antibiotics. They're too expensive. They don't accomplish anything if you have the animal at the proper level of health. We've learned that in human nutrition in the past two years, or you should have, if you have the proper level of vitamin D, the proper level of zinc, which, oh, by the way, come from the most 
abundant sources, which are animal agriculture and meat, milk, and eggs. But if you have a human at highest level of stress, so what do you get contract COVID? Your immune system fights it off. So in the animal world, my job is to keep that animal minimized in stress and everything else will take care of itself as God intended. I appreciate that and I'm glad you don't give all the animals antibiotics. But you and I have both agreed that Smithfield, for example, has a lot more pigs than you do. Um, how many pigs are on your farm right now? A couple hundred. A couple hundred. So circle four, at any given point in time, they're between 600 and 700,000. That's one but a you, small part of Smithfield. And that's a very small part of Smithfield's global operations. And, and just how many of those pigs, those 700,000 that are alive right now at circle four farms, are given antibiotics every single day of their lives? Not many. All of them. They can't afford it. No, they are affirming it. I've taken the photographs of myself inside their farms showing not only they're feeding every single one of these animals antibiotics, but they're feeding them antibiotic called Carbonox, Carbonox, which the FDA has been trying to ban for years because it is carcinogenic at all levels. Right? So when you have a few hundred pigs, maybe you can get away with not giving these animals antibiotics. Maybe the animals aren't getting sick and dying. When you're not holding the animals in crates the way Smithfield is, maybe when a pig doesn't get sick or does get sick, they don't immediately transmit the disease to every single one of the other 600,000 animals at that farm. But the reality is, when 83% of the farmland across the entire world is being used by animal agriculture, and when all the biggest and most dominant suppliers of food are companies like Smithfield, which, whatever I think of your operation, I think you and I would agree that your operation is better than Smithfield. This is another area we agree. But your operation is like a unicorn. It just doesn't exist in the world. What does exist is Smithfield Foods, where every single uh, animal is true. given antibiotics, Every single animal is raised in a crate, and where every single animal, when they get sick, poses a threat not only to every single other pig in that factory farm, but poses a, a, a serious existential threat to you and I. And we saw that in 2009 with swine flu, where we thought the first pandemic that could have killed us all, thank God it didn't, but only because of the luck of God. So I'm not a fan of Smithfield Foods because I don't believe that the Chinese government should have that much control over the resources that we should have to feed our people. I agree, my, I agree with you on that. that. That's where my concern about. Can we all agree on that? That we yeah, don't want the Chinese government to control our resources? Again, I'm a Chinese person, but I don't want the Chinese government. I don't want the Chinese you people. You said something there that is true, but got grossly misleading. Please, go ahead. Eighty-three percent of the world's land is used to feed animals. Farmland, not land, the farm. No, total land. Because there is so much of that land, about seventy-six percent of that land, that will not produce a food that will feed people. But yet 73% of that is used by ruminant animals, cows, which have one stomach, four chambers. They can go eat things you and I can't eat, and they convert it into the most nutrient-dense food substance on the planet. So the misrepresentation is that that 74%, 76% of the global landmass would not be used for food production. And California is teaching us what happens if you eliminate grazing, you eliminate logging, you get fires. Why was it so smoky today? in Salt Lake City Valley because we don't graze properly in California. There's a major fire around Susanville which is causing that problem here. If we don't use it to graze it with cows, God will bring about natural disasters like fire to correct everything. Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll tell you where I agree with you. And I think this is a point that we should all concede as animal rights advocates. I think it is true that a lot of the land that is being grazed by ranchers is land that's not arable for plant-based human because that, that is certainly four percent. What what I will also say is that there have been very good peer-reviewed estimates over the last few years, including publications, two publications in science and one that proceeds the National Academy of Sciences, is notwithstanding the fact that a lot of that land is being grazed for animals for food, in terms of total environmental impact, land use, water use, and especially climate change, it is still the case that the most climate-friendly and environmentally friendly animal-based foods are much more damaging than the worst plant-based foods. And there's a study that was just published by Oxford University scholars in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences by some of the world's foremost agronomists and ecologists, people who are not vegetarians and vegans. They don't have a, I was gonna say a horse in this race, but that's a terrible metaphor, they use that metaphor. They don't have, they don't have, they don't have What's wrong anything horse in this racing? We're against horse racing too? <laughs> that's a so totally different thing. <laughs> 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 we well, race each other. Yeah, I, I will tell you, if you saw what was unfolding at Golden Gate Field next door to where I live, and you saw the number of horses with broken limbs, you saw the stalls these horses had to live in, these horses are living in effectively the gestation crates. That's the subject of today's debate. So, okay, but let's move on and just say, I will study the studies, and I was someone, let me just finish my thought real quick. I was someone who was a little skeptical of the environmental argument for veganism and animal rights. 
for most of the last 15 years. In fact, I knew Pam Martin getting the shelf here in Chicago the first day. Yes, that 18 percent of all greenhouse gas emissions come from animal agriculture. That's a false statement. It is false, and they admitted that it was false. They actually clarified and said we do a full set of lists. One year later, we miscalculated. Yeah, they did say that. You're right. No, that's you're right. That's, that's true. Too. Yeah, I, I know these. I know these economists. Like I met them personally. I wouldn't say the friends, but they're acquaintances. And they did downwardly estimate and say, hey, maybe our initial estimates are wrong. It's actually more like 12 or 13 percent. No, that's fine. But uh, we can argue about that. No, but, no, you're not arguing with me. You're arguing, yeah. arguing with Dr. Frank Bettner at the University of California days. Well, I, I'm arguing. I'm arguing on behalf of the scientific consensus that's been published. I think the top peer reviewed journal of the sciences in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, which is among the top peer reviewed journals of the sciences, and an overwhelming consensus that has developed over the last 15 years. I went from being somebody who's a little skeptical of the environmental argument for veganism and against animal agriculture to saying now this consensus is reaching a point where it's similar to the argument that we have more plants so that we can feed more people and improve the environment. Case in point. 38% of the United States corn crop will have a, another record corn crop, 13 billion bushels in the United States. 38% of that corn crop goes to feed livestock. 33% roughly goes to produce ethanol. They have 20% that has historically been exported, roughly now it's about 17% in 2021. The rest goes into commercial uses. During the height of the photosynthesis season and the growing season of corn in the United States, each acre of corn growing converts 16,000 pounds of CO2 into oxygen. If we had more acres of corn, we would convert more oxygen or more CO2 into oxygen. In fact, it's so significant that the U.S. corn crop converts four times more CO2 into oxygen than the Amazon rainforest during the growing season. Not year-round, but during the growing season. So I can make the case from an environmental standpoint, continue to eliminate animals from the from the equation, from the cycle of life, you'll have fewer plants, you'll have less photosynthesis, you'll have less CO2 being absorbed and put into oxygen, it will destroy the planet because you've removed one part of the cycle of life, which makes no sense whatsoever. So corn plants, as all plants do, you're right, they do absorb corn. The replacement is not as good. You can't say, oh, well, you've got some corn fields, right. some soil plantations, and there's absorbing some carbon dioxide. It's, it's not enough to overcome the loss from losing the Amazon and the other wild spaces of this earth. It's clear that when the land is managed and a crop is grown, yeah. that it converts more than when it's just home. That's what I was talking about with the Biden initiative, following with the World Economic Forum at 30 by 30. If we continue to allow this land to just set in its wild state, it will convert less CO2. And all of, we're just focused on CO2. It converts many things that we've been told are bad. I'll give you another case in point. Just go for that hill over there. Number one reason, we've improved the soil, we've improved carbon sequestration, your term carbon sink, which by the way is much better than what we're trying to do now. Take carbon dioxide and bury it in the earth a mile deep. That's the most destructive environmental planet ever. So land being managed by humans improves the overall production and allows us to produce more with less, which is our goal in American agriculture and has been my family for six generations. Yeah, I and mean, that's one area where I agree with you. We need to use the land we are using for agriculture, whether it's any type of agriculture, as efficiently as possible, because when we do destroy wild spaces, in my view, we destroy the environment. And this might be an area where we have to agree to disagree. I'll send you a 2018 science study where Oxford researchers, again, not vegans and vegetarians, but just ecologists, looked at 37,000 farms across the entire globe, looked at their greenhouse gas impacts, their water usage, their land usage, and concluded, and this is their words, not mine, that the single biggest factor driving environmental destruction today, that each of us individually can do to stop environmental destruction, is shifting away from animal based diet to plant based diet. This is their conclusion, not mine. And I can share with you a 2014 study that the Food and Agricultural Organization put together from the United Nations, and they determined the greatest environmental impact is by the most intense animal agricultural systems in the world, and they point blank like said the United States is the best for the environmental stewardship of any country in the world because of the intensity of agriculture. Well, let's trade studies and, and talk about this by me now. Because I do want to move on. Let me to come back. What's that? Let me to come back. We'll come back again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I love talking to you, Trent. Um, so I, I want to talk about the ethical issues from animals, because we've been talking mostly about ecological and economic issues, but I think for many of the people, probably most of the people, not all the people in this room, the central reason we believe the slaughter of animals is not justified it has nothing to do with the ethical or the environmental or even the health consequences of eating animals. It has to do with the fact that we believe these are sentient things. So the first question I want to ask you is, 
in 2012, a number of the most distinguished neuroscientists in the world, from Caltech, Stanford, there's actually been a distinguished veterinarian from Washington State University, which if you know anyone Washington State, this is not some radical environmental university. Their veterinary school is the school that was retained by the Utah Department of Agriculture to justify the continued operations of meat farming in the context of COVID-19. So they went to Washington State to help them figure out how do we convince the world, even though all the meat are getting sick of COVID, and it's really dangerous for everyone, we can continue farming meat in Utah. So there was a veterinarian. I'm a huge meat fan, by the way. Say again? I'm a huge meat farming fan. Okay, so it was Washington State was supportive of the state of Utah and continued to money. And there was a veterinary expert from Washington State who supported this global uh, a conference sponsored by Francis Crick, who's a Nobel Prize winner, inventor of DNA, probably all of you know Watson and Crick. And universal, I think every single attendee of this conference signed a declaration that animals are conscious beings just like us, including birds, fish, octopi, dogs, cats, cows, and pigs. So my question to you, is do you believe that animals are conscious beings? Uh, there's a University of Michigan study that says trees and plants are conscious. <laughs> do you know that? I don't know that. I mean, right. I think a lot of this is more due to study. Well, it said that a plant yeah. actually reacts. I believe that the animals sure. are put here by God to improve the planet yeah. and improve the human health. And it's my job to give that animal the highest quality of life while it's here and then respect the take its life because everything lives, everything dies. And death with a purpose gives full meaning to life. Nothing lives without something dying. So I guess your answer is yes. I'll get to the, the tree point yes. in a second. But you do think that animals are conscious things, so they can feel pain and pleasure and joy and sex. I don't know about I don't know about pleasure, but yes, they can feel pain. <sighs> Why do you think they can't feel pleasure? Do you have a dog? You have dogs. I've talked to you about this. Yeah, I mean, you love your dogs, right? Yeah, you have I know. Well, session. I don't love my dogs. I love my, I love my family. Oh. I respect my dogs. My dogs are tremendous, valuable tools on my farm. Oh, so they're not part of your family. I thought you were saying the dogs are family, and I was getting kind of like, you know, teary-eyed. No, 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 no. Because you give me the choice between my dog and my daughters, there's a difference. But you love your dogs too, right? I don't love my dogs. Really? I respect my dogs. You could not live without my dogs. It is much, do you love the dogs? I don't love the dogs. I love my dogs. Your dog loves the dogs. I know she does. Your dog's a better person than you. Piece by piece, and the cortical structures, and I think they go piece by piece to the, the anatomy of the human 
right, and say, all the anatomical structures we have, oh, they almost have. They go through the physiology, the chemicals, the hormones, the neurotransmitters we have, they have too. And they go through behaviors too. All the behaviors we express, we cry out when we're in pain. We cry out sometimes when we're happy, and the cries are different. And there's actually just a study, you may have seen it. Did you see the study about artificial intelligence translating the language of pigs? Did you hear about this? Yes. It's a fascinating study where these computer scientists were able to basically decode the language of pigs. They found out that pigs have like hundreds of different calls, and we can actually use a computer to interpret what the pigs are saying and determine whether the pigs are happy or sad or distressed or scared or whatever. And that is very different than a book, a plant, See, I a tree. I don't computer to know what my pigs are saying because I read my pigs. Because you can know what they're conscious. I, I know they're, I never denied that. Yeah. What I said was there was a difference. My basis for that is it was to Genesis. Okay. I don't need to go anywhere other than Genesis. Okay, tell me more. What do you mean by God gives dominion of animals? You don't need to worry about that anymore. Uh, um, animals over, or man over animals. Yeah. My job is to take care of them with respect. Yeah. And understand that they're here for a purpose. That God put them here to improve the planet, his creation, and improve human kind. Yeah. I know I respect that position. I, I know a lot of incredible Christians. My good friend Bruce Friedrich is, is a Christian advocate for many, many years. Um, he's done a lot of Jesuit activism. He's Catholic. Um, and the thing is, Bruce was talking about. I picked Bruce up at the airport in Reno one day, took him to a really? cabin. Yes, he was fantastic. Yeah, he's a great guy. He is a good guy. He really is a good guy. And he's one of those people who, you know, I think like you, who is willing to talk to people who disagree. Like me, I aspire to him. But sometimes a little more rambunctious than maybe I should be. You know, apologize for insulting you a little bit. But I do think that's an important aspect for all as a whole. You know, because no, I. I, I yeah, but, and, and I think, I mean, the key thing about Bruce is, like, Bruce has always been someone, and this is the last part of me, he will speak his truth, and I think that should be my role. I think you should be honest with me, I should be honest with you. And the honest truth is, I think, I mean, things are very wrong. I think the slaughter of the hundreds of pigs isn't wrong. I think it's wrong. You probably think some of the things I'm doing. In fact, I'm quite sure you think some of the things I'm doing are wrong. Well, I don't know. 17 felonies first. 17 felonies is quite a few. Yeah, that's quite a few. Actually, that's a good point. But there's a difference between. Uh, I, well, I have had one, but they knew it was a mistake and I wasn't convicted of it. I'm glad that I never want you or anyone else, including the animals of there, to serve the living cage. Uh, but what Bruce always tells me, and other Christian vegans and animal rights activists tell me, is that the biblical concept of dominion did not involve violence. And to me, uh, even just the term you use, I'm going to borrow your language, that we, we deserve, or we, we owe to the animals respectful treatment. What is respectful? About slaughter. The Bible is full of sacrifice and slaughter of animals in the name of God and feeding the people. And you mix it, yeah. yeah. And, and in fact, before Jesus, there were people who were sacrificing their own kids. Yeah. I'm going to draw a line there. Yeah, I'm glad. But, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, <laughs> I think people in the room are probably happy about that too. Throughout the course of the Bible, there, there is slaughter of animals. Yeah. Uh, it's a component, it's a cycle of life, it's what he gave us. So if, if God told you to kill one of your children, though, would you do it? Just because God said this is what you should do? Yeah, I would want to have to get some clarity on that and get into church. I'm glad I think there's some other people who would also probably want some clarity. But to me, the confusion is a God that seeks violence and cruelty. And, and I have to confess, I'm not an expert in the Bible, so you're going to win this argument. Oh, okay. Okay. I'm, 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 I'm definitely not a theologist about that. Because yeah. I want to use another analogy that I wanted to get to earlier, but perfectly fits into this scenario. We're in Utah. Yeah. Nevada's right there. Idaho. There's seven states that have feral horses. You used the pigs earlier. I'm going to use the horses. I've personally been to allotments in Lovelock, Nevada, and north, where there's millions of acres and horses are running wild, and people want to romance those horses. But you don't really see what happens. There is nothing in the slaughter or harvest of an animal that comes close to the cruelty that the animal brings about to another animal. I'll give you a case in point. One day we're driving along, there's a stud laying on a broken leg. And the guy who runs in the metal allotment, he said, the right thing to do is to get on a gun and end the suffering of that animal right now. And if he does that, he's going to be charged with a felony because he's destroying federal property. The reason that animal is in that position is because the studs get in a fight over some chick, a man. And one of them ends up dying a natural death. It is horrible. These horses experience much more cruelty and inhumane deaths than any slaughterhouse ever brought about to any animal for food. But it's the, the question, nature of the beast. The question I'd ask you is should we be taking our cues 
on no, moral behavior. My answer to your question is from violence in the wild. To be taking our cues on how we should date as human beings who no, are living right. in such different environments that horses or lions or bears, from wild animals that are rightfully or wrongfully but committing acts of violence against each, each other. Is that at one point in time maybe we did do that pre 1900. And let's talk about Upton Sinclair because he contributed all of this a lot as well. But today we put chickens in CO2 chambers. So we put them to sleep. We do things in a way, and audit after audit has shown that 99.9999% of the animals are rendered unconscious and the process begins. I do not support inhumane slaughter. I would support quick, render it unconscious, and begin the process. It's that simple. And yet study after study after study, investigation after investigation, including one by the Washington Post a few years ago, finds that routinely the largest slaughterhouses in the nation, the most supposedly responsible processors have 5, 10, sometimes 15% of the animals still sensing while they're being torn to pieces on the slaughter. And this is especially true in poultry slaughterhouses because birds, and rabbits too, are not even considered animals under the humane slaughter. So there's no federal, in most cases, state requirement that the animals are actually unconscious while they're being torn to pieces of life. Would you support us in changing that? And they can show the animals believe like birds the are I should, treated I as animals. percent the animal needs to be rendered unconscious. Good. Yeah, but that's an area we're good. But, but here's the thing that's really interesting about that is you use these examples, Wayne, and I doubt there's a single person here who has made the choice not to eat animals, mm -hmm. would eat an animal even if it was done exactly right. I think you're right. Because they're fundamentally opposed to eating the animal. And even you yourself, you use these graphic images to portray that this is how it is everywhere, and that's not how it is everywhere. Sure. And it wouldn't matter if it was absolutely perfect. Yeah. People have already made the choice not to consume an animal because they want to share of love and kindness. Yeah. I just disagree with what love and kindness is. I see that that animal is put here to improve my body, to improve my family's body, and improve the creation that God gave us. Yeah. It's no more difficult than that. So let me ask you a question. Did you, you already said that you don't see the dogs as family. Correct. You don't love the dogs. Some of your family dates. Eighty that eighty-four percent of all pet owners consider themselves to be mother or father of the pet, and I think that's why you get money to do what you do. That's a problem. Well, I would say it's a problem. I think it, it's yeah, an exercise yeah. of compassion. I think it's people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I don't, I don't get a lot of money for the record trend. If you look at my bank account in the last ten years, yeah. I'll tell you it's gone down and down. Well, hey, we got eighty-seven thousand new IRS agents, so they're going to know what your revenue is. They'll know, and I'm happy for them to look at it because they're not going to find yeah, it. Yeah, so anyway, but. Right. My question for you is, you don't slaughter dogs for me. Why not? I'm not hungry. <laughs> but sometimes you're hungry, right? You're not hungry right now, maybe, but I'm sure by the end of the day you'd be hungry. You know, this goes back to the horse slaughter issue, which yes. I've fought more than any other one issue throughout the course of my 22 years of doing this. Yeah. I don't support that if you have a horse waiting in that horse to go to slaughter. That if you have a horse that you don't want to own anymore, you sell that horse willingly to somebody else that takes that horse then to back in the day to Cal, Illinois, and feed people where it actually improves something in another living thing. I'm all about that. So I'm not going to eat my own dog, Claire. If I sell my dog, Claire, and somebody else eats her, it's their dog. They can do with it what they want. But I'm not going to eat her. So you have no opposition to people slaughtering dogs? I do not because we're not hungry. Do you think most Americans agree with that assessment? Not at all. Yeah, so this is my area where 84% of Americans think that their dog is their kid. And that's the fundamental flaw of where we're at today. Why is that a flaw rather than a virtue? You think about your life. And I've heard you share your story of your life. Yeah. Food was hard to come by. Yes. And everything that we're talking about here today, everything at the Veggie Fest, is really about the factor of affluence. We had food come to us so easy that we now want to say, no, that's not right. We shouldn't eat that. If you were hungry, and your family depends upon the ability to find a calorie that's going to take you from today until tomorrow, you're going to have a whole different look in life. And it's a factor of affluence that's led us to this position. You go to the hungry, you know this. I'm not telling you anything you don't know. You go to the challenged countries of the world, and people don't have this discussion. In China, they're not having this discussion because people just want to find sustenance from one day to the next. They're also not having discussions about human rights. It doesn't mean human rights isn't important. I agree. So if you ask the average person in China with a the concentration camps in Xinjiang, the average person in China with a median income is $2,000 a year, they're not concerned about human rights because they barely can survive. That doesn't mean human rights don't matter. And it doesn't mean those of us who have the privilege to do something about it shouldn't do something about it. I care right? more about 42 million babies that have been aborted each year in the world. 
than I do any other thing we're talking about. And we can have a disagreement about that as well. But what I would suggest is that when you say that because the poor and underprivileged people in this world, including my parents when they're growing up, through, don't have this conversation, it means the conversation doesn't matter. I would disagree with that very vigorously. For one, the poor and the underprivileged the people of this world need this transition most. My parents grew up eating plant-based foods. You heard the talk I gave about how my mom used to say, like, yeah, I eat one egg a year. You know, we eat one meal we eat a year. It was the happiest day of our lives. And it's because when you're on an island like Taiwan and you have very little land to grow any food at all, guess what they use their land for? Human beings and their food. Not to raise animals because they can't justify it. It's not worth it. They can't afford it. For them to survive, they have to move towards plant-based food. But the other part where they go out and those people are coming. Say again? You're ignoring one imported component. Let me just say the second okay. point about this. The second point is the underprivileged people of this world who desperately need food, and there's still a lot of people suffering from food insecurity in the United States. The United States, not as much. You know, we've done a pretty good job of food security in the United States, although there's still a lot of food deserts. But the underprivileged people in this world, even if they don't see the intersections between their plight and the plight of other beings like animals that are treated like things in a commodified system, they are ones who are suffering. At the factories in China, where people are throwing themselves off the roofs, the mines in Sub-Saharan Africa, where people are sometimes dying from poison and toxins and heavy metals at the age of 35, you know, the unheard of disorders and diseases that people in the United States don't even, aren't even exposed to. All of these people are also being treated as new commodities by a system that is conceiving of all the living things of this earth as components in a profit generating machine. And this is one area where I disagree with you. I don't think animal farmers like Smithfield, and I don't even know if you believe this, because if you do, you don't understand the law. I don't think animal farmers like Smithfield, their main priority is making sure the animals don't have stress. Their main priority is making a buck for their owners. And if the animal has to be stressed or tortured or slaughtered or even eviscerated alive so I can save a little money, they're going to make that choice. They need to get out of the business if that's the case. You're here. Because if you're not putting... You just said, let's say it's out of business. You not me. Uh, Trent. What I said was... Let's out of business. Let's do it. If you don't put the best interest of the animal first, you're not going to be around. Yeah. And quite frankly, if you want to talk about Circle 4, I know when it was built. I was involved. And who built it? It wasn't yeah. site filled by itself. Originally, it was a group built by, why is it called Circle 4? There were four of the farthest, the largest four pig owners in the country that went together to build it. But that's not the discussion. The discussion is, are you, do you understand why we have the animals? And I can bring to Dr. Lindsay Allen. She did a tremendous study in, in Africa for two years, in Kenya to be exact. And she documented that kids who did not have animal products in their diet on a daily basis suffered in cognition, and overall immune health. Oh, well, well, and I did not just say that I did not just say you're not as smart as I am. What I said was the data shows that if you do not consume protein, animal protein, and fat, we demonize fat for a reason, because fat is where we really accomplish many things from an IQ standpoint. And Dr. Georgia E, who's put this all laid it all out from a psychological standpoint, we eat animals to improve the human health and we improve the planet. I won't go anywhere else other than that, man, because that's why we do it. So I don't actually even disagree with you about the importance of fats. I think fats are important. I think most of us probably agree fats are important. They just don't have to come from a slide and an animal. And what I will say is that if you believe that animals and animal proteins are necessary to the human diet, I will, I will come back to you with the two most ancient and numerous, in terms of just population civilizations, on the planet Earth, India and China. And the fact that India has more vegetarians than anywhere in the world. It is the dominant diet under the Hindu religion. In China, Buddhism has existed for thousands of years. The ideal in the Buddhist tradition is for everyone to eat plant-based. And if these cultures have thrived for thousands of years, how do you explain that? If you think that animal-based protein is necessary for the human diet. I don't, I don't follow your logic at all. The United States then is too Are you saying India is a myth that it doesn't exist? I mean, it exists. Yes, certainly, there's people who survive, but how do you, you define thrive? Is what I don't follow. Well, I'm just saying, like in the United States, we've been a country for 248 years. We've been a meat eating country taking care of animals for 248 years. And in a very short time, not thousands of years, we actually created opportunity and accumulated wealth for its citizens. Yeah. Well, I'd say for China, for example, you know, this is the dominant civilization for a thousand years, from the fall of the Roman Empire to through the Dark Ages. Correct. 
And, and again, the, the traditional Chinese diet, of, you know, De Calm Campbell puts it much better than I do in the China study, is almost 100% plant-based. We eat almost no milk because 95% of us are lactose intolerant. China is not as bad as Taiwan in terms of the agricultural land, but there's only a tiny sliver of China. China's this massive country, right? If you look at Atlas, there's only a tiny sliver of coastal land where they can raise animals for food and raise plants for food. And because of that, for most of that thousand year time period where China was a dominant civilization, and even to this day, the Chinese to this day eat less than half the amount of animal products as the United States. And most of the time when they do eat animal products, it's in these hyper industrialized, westernized cities like Shanghai and Beijing. If you're out in the outskirts, like where I was when I was investing in dog meat and eating in China, most of those people are eating plant based. And even though they're super poor, they're super they lacking in healthcare and resources, you never see anyone who's obese, you don't see people with diabetes, you don't see people with cancer. They may be malnourished, but they're not sick in the way Americans are because they're eating plant based. That's simply not true. Because if you look back, if you go back to 1977, and I would suggest everybody read the Big Fat Surprise by Nina Teichel. I'm going to take you to China. We'll go to China today. Uh, I'll, I'll take you to one of these things. So like if you're eating and eating mostly plant-based diets, you'll see how many obese, diabetic, cancer patients, heart disease you'll find. Not that there are serious health problems. There are. But the traditional diet-based health problems that exist in the United States, you won't find in rural China. So, pre-1942, the United States getting in the World War II as we did. Lard became one of the most viable commodities during World War II. And lard was important because number one, lard is the most readily available source of vitamin D. Vitamin D derives the, the immune system. But they were making lard for ammunition in World War II. But what farmers were doing is that they were making butter because butter is extremely important. And so they take the butter fat from milk and then they would take the skim milk and feed it to the pigs because skim milk to pigs, not the whole milk, would make the pigs more fat and have more lard because they need it for ammunition. And what has the dietary guideline attempted to get us to do since 1980? To eliminate animal fat and animal protein. And I agree with you 100%. The health and the condition of the United States citizen is less today than it's ever been. And if you look at what consumption habits have actually done since 1977, it's been to low fat, higher carbohydrate, higher starch diets, which has led to all of the problems that we have today in terms of chemo diet. So, as someone who's a devotee to chemo diet, sorry to anyone who's a big car person, but I am personally trying to eat a keto diet. It's also a plant-based keto diet. You know what you do, Wayne? If you just go with bacon on your keto diet, you can eliminate a lot of other stuff. But the, the fact uh, the fact that you neglected to point out over that same time period when we started eating all these processed carbs is meat consumption also increased. Yeah, right. You're and now it's all our and now it's chicken. Yeah. And pork has been the same. But we can go back to the numbers and you know we don't have them before us today. But I can, if you look at the chart of the last few years, meat consumption as a whole has increased partly just because it comes in. Oh, we eat more meat. And so as Americans have gotten richer, we eat more meat. Let me ask you this. Uh, I think I've asked this before. Is there an argument for animal rights that you found particularly convincing? And you think, you know, this is made me think, and I'm sympathetic to this. No. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> when I go home from here, I'm going to think about everything you said. I'm going to think about everything everybody's doing the last hour and the walking uh, on the street out here. Why do I do what I do? Why do I believe that gestation stalls are a good thing? So many of us in agriculture, we do it because, well, that's the way we've always done it, or that's what the science says we should do. But by being involved with people like yourself, which has been tremendously productive for me, I, I go home and I say, if I can't answer to myself, I can't answer to you. And so that has been very productive and why I continue to have that discussion is I don't want to do anything carved off because it's the way to do it for profitability. There's no future in that. Yeah. If you're not doing things that are beneficial to the animal, you're not going to be around to be part of profitability. And so my greatest value that I've achieved is making sure that everything I do has a purpose. And the purpose is to decrease stress of the animal. So you've said this a couple times now that if you do not take care of the animals, if your primary focus isn't decreasing the stress of the suffering the animals, you're going to disappear. You're going to go out of business. Correct. Right. Do you think that's true of Smithfield Foods? Smithfield Foods has a wherewithal to continue to do things that most of us cannot do. The other thing Smithfield Foods does that you left out of the equation is that they have their south centers, which you've been talking about, Circle Four. 
But where do they? Fifty thousand sows right. on one site. But where do they? One farm, fifty thousand. But that's not fifty thousand sows is not a big deal because the pigs leave there. And where do they go when they leave there? They go to independent. You you referenced them, though you didn't draw the picture. They go to independent farms that are providing care for those. What I'm talking about here. They go to smaller farms that are seeking a diversification in their farming operation that would tell you they would not still be on the farm if it wasn't for a contract with Smithfield or any of the other entities. I don't hold it against any farmer who has a contract with somebody that allows them to continue to be in the pig business. But those sows produce those pigs, and those pigs leave and go to another location, and then go back to Iowa and leave that. Some of them leave, some of them stay. A lot of them do stay because it's a, it's a finishing facility, too. They have nurseries and finishing barns on site. The ones that stay are staying there for the purpose of reproduction. And they would funnel them back into their south systems. Yeah, not a circle four. Circle four is finishing barns, so I've been inside of it. But, but that's not here and there. Uh, so I guess I, it wasn't clear to where you answered this. You said that a corporation or a farmer that doesn't prioritize the welfare and the stress of the animal Correct. is not going to survive. And yet it seemed to be, it seemed to me what you were saying is that Smithfield is an exception to that. Yet Smithfield isn't the exception, Smithfield is the rule. It's one third of all the pork production in the United States. And if you look at all the other big pork production facilities, they're not people like you that have a couple hundred animals, whatever you think of that. There's more of us in your It's here. companies like ISF, it's companies like Tyson and Cargill, all of which don't have a couple hundred animals. They have hundreds of thousands at one site. They have millions collectively across the nation, across the world. And I'll give you one example egg farming in Sonoma County, which actually we met because yeah, it's an action and an egg farm. You know how many farms are left? In Sonoma County, egg farms? No, man. Three. You know how many birds each of these farms has? A lot. Millions. Same number. Millions. More than you have processed in your entire life. Each of these farms in one year is doing much more than you've done in your entire life. So what is that? So you're saying, what I'm saying is that you're saying, well, you know, like a real good farmer focuses on the welfare and the stress the animals are experiencing. Yet what you call the exception, Smith people, which you know, you and I have agree, they're not prioritizing the stress of the animal, the suffering of the animal. That is not the exception. That's the rule. And the reason is, and this, I'm going to be a lawyer now. The reason is, Smithfield is a publicly traded corporation in the United States of America. It's also it's a subsidiary of a corporation in China. China. And their legal purpose is to maximize profits. And if their board of directors does not maximize profits, if they're, for example, focusing on the stress of the animal rather than the profit of their shareholders and their owners, principal shareholder being the billionaire in China, they can get sued. They can be liable themselves. Correct. So how can you have any confidence in a system that is maximizing the shareholder returns, the owner profits for a billionaire in China, and they are the most dominant player in the entire system of corporate production in the United States? Once again, you're not going to get me to say something positive about the ownership of Smithfield Foods. I'm not a fan. Yeah. But we need to have a bigger discussion. How did that happen? How did that concentration in food production take place? And it took place because people wanted to go buy their groceries at a very consolidated number of stores. There's one store in this country that ironically has 33% of the grocery sales. And as long as you continue to flock, it's Walmart, it's great. As long as you continue to flock to the same retail outlets and force this consolidation, Walmart forces this consolidation all the way back to the farm system. The only way out of this, and this is something that if you follow what I do every single day on radio and TV, I talk about you need to buy from your local producer. You need to have a relationship with people within your community to access your food. That's the only true change that we make. Wayne, you can support Proposition 12, you can support legislation all you want, you can support moratoriums. They've never made an impact in the consolidation of the ownership of the food system. We need more diversification in the ownership of the food system, and that's only accomplished if every one of us is 330 million strong as consumers start buying from people that we can look in the eye and have a discussion with. That's the answer to the future. And that's usually going to be a plant-based food source. Because the reality is... Everything when, starts with a plant-based food source. So every well, animal has to eat a plant. But well, what I'm saying is that you may be the exception to the rule. You may be someone, even with your dog, if you're fine with someone killing your dog. But so you and I agree. Oh, no, you said yourself that 83% of Americans see their dogs, 84% of Americans see their dogs and cats as family members. They, they love their dogs and cats. They don't want to see their dogs and cats slaughtered. And you cannot have a real, transparent conversation with someone. Show them what's happening, even in a smaller scale farm like yours. 
I, I will tell you this because I have shown people slaughter footage from small scale farms in China, for example, where they're slaughtering dogs. Yeah. And people cannot even bear to look at those videos or photos for a second. Right. They avert their eyes, they say, do not show me that. And these are small scale facilities. So the reality is, to the extent Americans are looking face to face at their farmers and saying, I want to see how your food is being produced. I want to feel good about the choices I'm making, the support I'm giving you. 84% of Americans have animals in their own households that they love. 84% of Americans, if not higher, don't want to see animals killed for food. And so in the long term, the more we actually have these conversations, I think right. the more people are going to transition towards a completely plant-based system. Of food. Started, it's, it's not as scary to watch a soybean being harvested than to watch a pig being killed. When I started going to animal rights meetings in 2000, I went to a farm's event in Alexander, Virginia, I like your shop, I met him. And at that time, 3% of the United States population- And Alistair Chap is the Holocaust survivor who's become an animal rights activist. Correct. Because he's drawing parallels between Correct. what happened in that time period and what happened in Alistair. This is his comparison, not mine. Correct. And he's actually, I should say, you know, he's obviously Jewish or something. And at that time, 7% of the United States population considered him to be so, be a uh, vegetarian. 3% vegan. And today, if you look at the numbers, it's not 84% don't want this to take place. We still have the same number, the same percentage of people who choose not to eat milk, meat, and eggs as we did in 2000 when I went to that first convention. Yeah, I mean, so I, your number is flawed. I, I'm not disagreeing with you about that. Uh, but I'm, what I would say is that, well, there are not many more vegetarians than vegans. To me, that's part of the reason why the animal rights movement is to pivot its focus away from just convincing individuals to eat a particular diet. Because, frankly, it's hard to change people's diets, and most people are going to eat what their friends, their family members, their community members eat, to focusing on systemic and institutional change. Things that you and I might agree on, like any farm subs, like shutting down some food. I was not the first person today in this room to say we should shut down some lose trends. A big problem, right? These are areas where we can agree. And if we do transform these systems, and there are more plant-based options that are available at every Burger King, every McDonald's, and every school system, you know, when I was growing up, I was fed milk every day. If I'm a Chinese person who's lactose intolerant, I was told I had to eat milk. So guess what I did? I ate milk, even though it hurt myself. It hurt me. Like, I was getting digestive problems every day when I came home. I don't even want to tell you the details. Too much information. No, it's disgusting. Way. But I was eating stuff that was hurting me because the system was telling me what to do. So most people are not good at making independent choices, especially in a world where people are struggling in so many different ways. So we don't need to convince people to go vegan and vegetarian. It's great when you are. And a lot of people in this room are to me heroes. It's kind of a miracle to me that there's any vegans in the world, in a world where the food supply, the advertising, the fast food system, even your schools are telling you every waking moment, you have to eat animals, you have to eat animal products. It's a miracle that anyone's a vegan. But until we change the overriding system, including any support from you and people like you, and any farm sites, and shutting down big corporate factory farms like Smithfield, and replacing them with much better, much sustainable, much healthier companies like Beyond and Possible, we won't see people transitioning to vegan. They've been a financial disaster. Beyond? Yeah. Beyond hasn't been doing so well. But I will still say <laughs> that's an understatement. Like, to me, the goal of Beyond, including for the owners of Beyond, isn't to make a return for their owners and to their detriment. You know, they have them. They they can't even sell their the goal, product. Ethan Brown's goal, is to shake up the food system and save the planet. Right? And by that well, measure, they're, they're, they're doing a pretty good job of saving the goal. Well, good. I'm glad you guys that animals are component of saving the planet, and that's what we get left out of the equation. Yeah, I'd ask you to look at these things. Here, here's the other part that I want to get to, and I feel like we're about to that point in time when we need to let everybody go, but we, we've spent a lot of time talking about dietary choices. For sure. And I often say that there are no vegans, because we've already established early on that there are components of animals in your phone, there's components of animals in every single vehicle, there's a component of animal in Insects and all grain? It, insects and all grain. You know, I didn't, you didn't give me the opportunity to bring up the least harm principle out of Oregon State University. We talked about seven times more animals that would be killed if we didn't eat animals because we increased we increase the number of animals that are killed in grain production. But you have to recognize that there is a value in animal agriculture, even if it's not part of your diet. Well, again, I think we'll have to agree to disagree. And I actually just took, took, did just check the time. It's 4 7. I don't want to be uh, respectful of your time because I need to leave by 4 I'm all just going to fill some questions. Yeah, let's fill some questions. So, my last question to you is, is this Why don't more farmers do what you do? Why, why do we have such difficulty talking to each other? And is it our fault? Is it the farmer's fault? I mean, how do we change that? 
we change them one day at a time, which is what you and I are doing. Yeah. Right. And uh, it, you know, I, I've been perplexed in the last two years how many times people are just driven by fear to avoid things. And uh, I had zero fear coming here. I had every optimistic opportunity to think about meeting and visiting with people and look, look forward to meeting and visiting with everybody that I possibly can and just walking and, and, and making sure that I understand why people make the decisions that they make. And that, I think, at the end of the day, is what we have to ask for is make more decisions based upon facts for sure. rather than propaganda from Trent or Wayne. Does that sound? Well, I hope you find more farmers like you as opposed to corporations like Smithfield that try to imprison the critics instead of talking to them. And yeah, I really appreciate being here today. Well, don't misunderstand. If you, if you come illegally on my farm and steal one of my animals, I'm probably not going to be real fond of that. But we can have this discussion. <laughs> I agree with that too. And, and I, well, I agree that you're not going to be very fond of it, but there are farmers, including Utah, who have been supportive of that. You know, Rick Pittman's one of them. He did an investigation on the Rascal Farms. He saw the animals he took out were quite sick, that they were not going to make it. He said, you know what, you're just trying to save lives. There's nothing wrong with that. And he's going to be testifying on my behalf at trial. Not about the field, on my behalf. Saying that what these people are doing is just trying to get the world trying to question. There's nothing wrong with that. But I think you're right. Let's, let's open things up to questions. We can't take too many. And I'm going to ask you to keep your questions brief because Trent doesn't even leave by at the latest about 4 30. <coughs> Does anyone have any questions or comments? They want my name, my name's pretty excited about asking. Yeah, please. Brian, you want to just shout it out? Please, I'm switching with a question. Queen. I didn't try to stop. We're done with this. If you can build me, I'll broke your lips over. I'll just take that. Okay. Please, go ahead, Brian. I'm going to ask you to go out to farmers, ranchers, and a huge supply chain supply chain to grocery stores. So that we all come behind you tonight. My question is how much more does it cost to both keep farmers and produce food versus pick field? And how does a consumer choose to buy the both keep farmer who treats for an animal trend? That's a great question because it's significantly higher cost to do what we do. And, and I'm not setting myself apart. There are uh, thousands of farmers that do like what we do. But the cost is significantly higher because they have all these costs spread out over a larger percentage of inventory. There's no doubt about that. Now, we can utilize technology. I'll give you an example. Uh, we have a very small operation, and yet in our gestation market, we have a computer that feeds us out. So the sow will walk into a station, which is kind of like a gestation stall, it can exit anytime it wants to, but it'll walk in there, it's got RFID tag, it sticks its head in the feeder, the computer knows what style it is, it gives it the same amount of feed it's supposed to give it every single day. Now, that is a, a, a big expense that we chose to do because I wanted to provide the most optimum environment for my gestating style as possible. But the interesting thing that we've done, Brian, is that I uh, talk about how bully styles are, we have styles that go in there and just lollygag for an hour because that's their safe haven. There's nobody vocal biting, nobody's biting their ear, nobody's beating up on them when they do that. So we're a little, a little bit strange because I had some connections and I got a really good deal on this system, but it costs a tremendous amount more per pound to raise it the old way, the way we, the way we raise it, compared to in the larger integrated systems like you're talking about. And this is also an area where we agree it does cost much more to get even the most basic standards of welfare animals in an animal farm. In contrast, there have been a number of studies and media reports and even prices we'll see in Costco today showing that plant-based meats are now basically priced fair. The Beyond Burger is costing about a buck per patty, which means it's a little over four bucks per pound at Costco. The price of about meat around the country is 49 per pound. And we've been saying for generations we can raise animals humane, even backed up in Sinclair. And the consumer will be able to price it out and it will not be too high of a cost. When people like you say plant based meats are a pipe dream, I say, no, regenerative agriculture. I never thought it was a pipe dream. You knew you were sorry. Maybe you didn't say it. People I, like you. Maybe I, not you yourself. But other people have said nobody wants it. The demand has not been there. All the fast food restaurants went to plant based burgers, they left them. And I'm glad you reminded me about it from St. Clair, who wrote the book The Jungle, who also had his doctor tell him two years later, either eat meat or you're going to die and stuck out of starvation. And did come back from the Yeah, I, I would just have to disagree with your numbers on this because while plant based companies in certain circumstances, I just blog about this, Beyond and Oakley are not doing so well. If you look at the broader trajectory, especially if you look at institutional openness, if you had asked me 10 years ago 
if Burger King would have a plant-based burger in every single restaurant across the nation, I would have laughed at that. Mm -hmm. That is a reality today. Exactly. And that is a very, very important change. So many other questions. Right there, young lady. So you um, talk about the Bible and how God gave us dominion over the animals and how it's natural to eat animals. Um, and I used to eat meat. I used to go hunting and fishing with my dad. Mm -hmm. And it made me feel terrible on the inside. Mm -hmm. If God intended for us to kill animals and to eat them, why do we have a conscience that makes us feel bad about it? Like if you were to bring an animal on stage right now and even do it in a quote-unquote humane way where you shoot the animal in the head and then whatever, Nobody would want to watch that. Everybody would leave. So why mm -hmm. why is that? I assure you I could fill this auditorium if I brought a pig on stage and went through the processing process mm -hmm. right now. It may not be the people that are here, but I assure you I can find people in Salt Lake City who would want to come in and watch exactly how it's done. So because why, we've not been in connection with it. In connection with it. So the people who have connected with animals, if God meant for us to do these things, why are there any of us who, who feel badly about it? I can't answer why people feel the way they do. What I can answer is that God put those animals on the planet to help us and help his creation. There's no other reason he put them here. He didn't put them here as pets. They have a purpose. Have you read the book Dominion? No. Would you consider it? I know what the book Dominion says. Okay. I've met Matthew. What do you think of it? So Dominion is a book written by a Christian conservative who is George W. Bush's chief speechwriter, arguing that the biblical concept of Dominion, even going back to the Garden of Eden, and any time before Noah's Ark, was a plant-based vision, that even the lion left the lay with the lamb. You know, so the biblical idea was nonviolence and compassion towards everyone. Why isn't that a beautiful thing for you if you believe in a compassion? God? Because I, I know how animal consumption helps my life. I see how it helps the environment around us. And throughout just the last 100 years, look at the Great Plains of America. When they started coming from the West, back in that Oregon Trail that we were talking about the last time, the Great Plains of America was called the Great American Desert. And what changed it from the Great American Desert into this great resource-producing nation of the world? The management of the land and the utilization of animals to make it better. And at the end of the day, I see with the animal products, data after data shows that animal products improves human health. That's what. So we can and show that that's probably and my base food was better for the environment. Absolutely. And I, I would look then you would you join us in seeking a more compassionate world. If I do, we don't climb it. No doubt. Okay. That's just a fashion matter. And I'd say if your read science is very clear on this, plant based food is better for the planet. But let's ask another question. John? Uh, does God mandate that we consume animals? Your question was does God mandate that we consume animals? Or that we kill them and is there this gray area where, when it's not for survival, we ought to, the, the most respectful thing to do would be to let them live? That's actually a principle of the Church of Latter-day Saints, right? Mm -hmm. That it's not for survival. Is there anyone who's LDS in the room? So, Is that correct? We are in Utah. Yeah, we are in Utah, so I think it's perfect. So, so I don't think God mandates that we get animals. No. Uh, but I and think so, that's a great question that will require more pontification on my part. And so, yeah, I suppose if we're not being mandated by God to behave in such ways, then uh, we have choice, right? Mm -hmm. And if we have choice, what would the most respectful choice be toward an animal who doesn't have to die for our survival? Well, God gave us ten commandments to live by. Well, just to refer and back to the question, the just to refer back to the question, mm -hmm. uh, what would the most respectful way to treat this animal be in a situation where we aren't, we don't have to kill them to survive. I see, I, I do not concur that by killing them, we're not respecting them. So you would because say, yeah. they were put here to improve the creation and improve human health. And I'm not going to eat them alive. So we're going to have to do that. So you're saying, so that's for survival, right? Not for survival. So you're for saying it's okay. Enhancing the planet and enhancing human life. So what you're saying, if I understand correctly, is that... Can you fall your time, Just so I understand, you're saying that uh, to kill someone who doesn't have to die for no, your survival... No, 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 Wait, no, let, no, just no. let me finish real quick. 
Are you saying that to kill someone who doesn't need to die for your survival is not disrespectful? I do not put that life of an animal on that equal to that of a I, human being. I don't either. Okay. So, 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 you, so, would you, so you would agree that it is disrespectful? To kill a human being? To, uh, I think animals. you're saying it doesn't put the animal's life at the same level. So killing is not a disrespectful action for you. Is that right? An animal for human consumption is not disrespectful. Not, what about killing for entertainment? If someone just kills an animal, I don't want to do that. I, ju I just feel like... So, yeah, so like dog fight, you're against that. Uh, Watching two dogs tear each other to pieces for fun. There are so many things about that. There are so many layers to dog fighting. That's what dogs do, naturally. To uh, put them together in a pit, to train them to do things that are not natural. I'm not, I'm not in favor of that. And you think a gestation period is natural? Right? Absolutely, a gestation period. How do you distinguish what's out. natural well, here, I mean, from what's not? Well, let me ask you this. Well, actually, we don't have a lot of time here, so um, I, I want to ask you at least one last question, okay? Because I know we're just about out of time. Go. That's okay, everyone. And if Trent has a little more time, you, you all can ask him. I'll be glad to answer that a little bit. But the last question I wanted to ask, to make, make sure we have time, the answer is, what advice do you have for him when it's at this? I mean, maybe maybe he gives bad advice and tells because he doesn't agree. agree. So let's, let's put on your, your best face and, and, and treat yourself as like a consultant to the analyze it. What do you think we're doing wrong that we should be doing better? Like genuinely. The like what? Genuinely. What do you think oh, we should be doing better? Yeah. I'm going to repeat something that I said earlier. Make sure that the information that you're receiving about what led you to this thought process is accurate. If it's accurate, then we have a great discussion. If you're getting back, because I'll tell you on the street out here today, I've been told a lot of things that are absolutely inaccurate about why you're vegan and why we need to stand up for the life of animals. As long as the information is veganism is going to make me fly, that's what I was investing. As long as you're, you're making that decision based upon truth, I don't have any argument with you. That's a good point. I agree with you. So I think we said at the beginning one of our ground rules we're going to try to put some points of consensus. So I think we should try and find some of these now. If that's okay with you before you leave. Does that sound good? I'm good. What do you think we've, we've agreed about? We should try and maybe even work together. Well, we agreed that we would neither one like to see Smith go on by China and the United States taking our resources. And maybe China, maybe not just on by China. I mean, you're the one who said that maybe we should just be shut down completely. No, you, you said, said that. that. I didn't actually say that. But I was interpreting what you said. Because we have a tremendous acceleration of farmland and resources being purchased by individuals from China, and that puts us in a very uh, dangerous situation when it comes to national security. The ability for not individuals, billionaires, at the best of the Chinese government. Absolutely. It's not the ordinary working class people in China buying land in the United States, I'll tell you that. Dagan Wang, that's a good place to start. We'll look up Dagan Wang. He owns 80% of all the movie theaters in this country. He owns AMC, he finances almost everything made in Hollywood. He's a danger to the future of this country because a country that cannot produce its own food, what is plant or animals, I don't care, or cannot produce its own electricity, fuel, you're in jeopardy. We've seen that around the world. And so everything that I do is to make sure that the United States has a food security issue and an energy security issue. And in 2018, for the first time ever, the United States was a food or a fuel energy nation producing not only the energy that we need but exporting it to other countries and policies have destroyed that and based upon misinformation no i i i, I might not agree with everything in terms of the framing of what you said but i certainly agree that the chinese government is not the entity we want to control in any way this food system i don't even want to control the chinese food system frankly given the number of food safety systems they have over the last 50 years hey here's another good thing Please. for all animal rights individuals we now know that fossil fuels are not from dead so, there was no dinosaur. Thank God for the luxury of your life. Get in my car and feel unconscious as a piece. Here's another thing I think we agree on. Um, you know, like conscious, we should avoid, avoid causing them pain. Absolutely. We agree I do not agree with causing animals pain. And, and, and also, I think that there are a lot of corporations out there that are causing a lot of unnecessary pain. Things like Smithy. Would you agree with that? <laughs> I love that you always come back. For the, the, the sentimental value of in Smithfield. I mean, this is late. That's classic. Bruce was really good at that too, by the way. Finding that one issue we can circle back to for emotional pleas. We do not believe in disrespecting life, period. All right. Anything else you think we can agree on? Um, whether beer is animal product.
bucks under a uh, stupid CEO that's out of being investable. <laughs> Sounds good to me. Sounds good to me. All right, thanks so much. I appreciate being here, Trent. Thank you. There's a little time we have now. I think Trent has to leave at 4 30. I want to make sure people have an opportunity to say something in person if you'd like. So, Trent, if you're okay with it, it sounds like you are okay with it. Folks can ask him some questions, discuss with him. I'm going to be a little for the next hour, hour and a half until the Veg Fest uh, closes as well.